good evening to all of you and welcome to this session. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we were just waiting for a few more people to come in. Um, and I think it is time for us to start now because it's getting a bit late and I wouldn't want to hold you all up. This whole session should take about an hour or so, uh, depending on if you have any question that you'd like to ask me. Now, uh, I would like this to be a sharing session. It is not going to be a lecture. I'm here to share with you my experience about what business acumen is all about. And of course, you can also share your experience with all of us. And I believe all of you have come in here with a wealth of experience, uh, having worked in the industry for so many years. All right, um, let's start off with a brief introduction very quickly of myself. Hold on, yeah. Yeah, my name is uh, Frankie, and I've been teaching for 26 years. Um, I've been teaching on and off for Adventist, and I've been around for quite a long time, uh, being a business consultant, a salesperson in the past, and also have been teaching in most of the big private schools in Singapore, name them, I've been there, SIM, PSB, and all these uh, places. Uh, I have actually been there, um, so I've been around for a long, long time. Uh, these are my qualifications. I started off in, 19, in the mid-90s, getting a postgraduate diploma in marketing. Then I went on to do my bachelor's degree in economics, uh, majoring in economics. And then I went on to do my master's degree with the University of Birmingham. And over the years, I also upgraded myself. I got quite a number of teaching certification. Uh, I've always enjoyed teaching. Right now, I teach in Aventis. I also teach in um, quite a number of places as well, like Kaplan. I also teach in uh, SPJ, which is a, a global business school. And uh, I also teach in SIM. So tonight, I'm here to share with you about business acumen at, at any one time, at any point in time. If you want to ask me a question, you can always do so. Just on your mind and just speak, all right? Otherwise, you can always type into the chat room. And I will try to answer your question to the best of my knowledge. Of course, I know I may not be able to answer all the questions, um, but I'll try my best. And I welcome all of you to also share your experience with each other. Like I said, I'm not going to make this into a normal lecture uh, because this is not an MBA course. And hopefully at the end of this uh, uh, session, you might want to decide to pursue an MBA with Aventis. And if you want to ask me questions about you know, pursuing a master's program, you may also do so at the end of the session. Okay, now I'd like to start off by talking about the success of a company that all of us are familiar with, all right? And that is the success of Apple. All of us are familiar with this story, isn't it? How could Apple actually change the way we communicate? Even though you may be an Android user, it does not matter, but you do know about Apple, isn't it? All right, how is it possible that we, how is it possible for Apple to become so big? that today Apple has got the highest brand value worth trillions of dollars, all right? But do you know that Apple was actually not the first to give us a smartphone? Because long before we had Apple, we already had one generation of smartphone called the PDA phone. Uh, those of you who remember, all right, the PDA phone well, what happened here is that we actually have, uh, we, we actually use all those uh, uh, smartphones. Uh, 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 that was probably in the 90s. And then, of course, things start to change. And that was when we actually have, um, you know, the uh, Apple becoming very strong. And that's when we see how Apple grew right, from, uh, um, uh, grew from uh, sorry, grew very quickly and grew exponentially. And it became what it is today. Now, what is so special about Apple that whenever they launch a product, it becomes world news, that people become addicted to Apple. They said that Apple becomes like the industry standard, you know, that everybody is watching the launch of the new Apple phone, that when they launch the new Apple phone, it becomes a world news. So I would like to start off by asking you to start thinking about why you feel Apple is uh, a good phone. All right, Ken? Now, maybe now I'm going to pay something into the chat room. If you could, you just click on it, and then you will be able to key in your answer the reasons for Apple's success, all right? You, can you see it? Hold on, let me just uh, click to everyone. And I'm going, just going to send it in now to the chat room. All you need to do is just click on it and you will be able to, you will be able to uh, uh, key in your answer, all right? 
So I'm just going to give you about two or three minutes to do so. Just quickly tell me what do you think are the, the reasons for success for Apple? Those of you who just joined us, I've actually sent a link to the chat room. You may just click, click onto the, uh, uh, the link and then you can tell me why you feel Apple is so successful. All right, it is just a normal activity for us to do. Yeah. The chat room can you see it in the chat room okay i'll just cut and paste again in the chat room all right okay can you see yeah it? yeah but if we go to this link uh i, I think it seems like uh, we need to sign in all we right you just give, all right Ken. then no problem at all you can't see anything is it all right just give me a minute let me just see if i can do it. either we need to sign up or we need to sign in if we have an account Oh, okay, it says so. All right, then never mind. Can somebody just openly discuss why you think uh, Apple is so successful? Anybody? You can actually tell me. Anybody can tell me why you think it is so successful. Uh, I think uh, maybe innovation. Innovation, very good. Some more? Very good marketing strategies. Marketing strategies, yeah? And what else? I see somebody is able to post uh, onto the, I can see that somebody is able to post it. Okay. Yeah. So innovation, user friendliness, uh, good leadership. Are you able to post? I can see many of you are able to post. Is it because you, you logged in? No, you just have to double click and then you get like a box. Can yes, that's right. Box. You know, right at the bottom, you'll be able to see the plus sign. You are able to click on the plus sign and you right. should be able uh, to I keep think, it. I uh, think the double click works. Okay, I can see some answers. Attention to details and keep things simple. Good leadership, very good. All right, we talk about Steve Jobs. Uh, really, user friendliness, innovation. Good. Some more? Anybody else? Listen to the customers. Very customer oriented, isn't it? <laughs> Anybody else still contributing, typing, or what? Okay, I'll just give about one more minute. <clears throat> Okay, good. You can see on the screen now, a lot of very interesting answer has changed the way we see technology. Okay, attention to details, listen to customers, user-friendly, customers trust. Why is it that the customers actually trust uh, Apple? Hmm, many of you say uh, 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 innovation, quality of the product, okay? Brand management, they manage the brand very well. That's good. Okay, I believe all of us are actually users of Apple at some point, isn't it? You may not own an Apple phone, but you may have an Apple iPad. Very few of us don't even have one, uh, uh, don't even, very few of us, you know, um, can say that we don't own any Apple products, isn't it? There are very few of us can actually say that. So most of us actually own at least one Apple product. Okay, good. Thank you very much. All right, I see some very good answers there. Uh, all right. Quality of products, that's correct. All right, we see quality of products. Okay, let's... Okay, good. Can I ask you what you all see on the screen right now? Hello, what do you see on the screen right now? Yeah, we, we see the activity presentation. Okay, good. So what happened here is that uh, some very good answers. All right, we do not forget 
that the key success of Apple is actually Steve Jobs, isn't it? Effectively, Steve Jobs has changed the way we communicate. All right, and that's why many people were so afraid that with the demise of Steve Jobs, what happened here is that um, you know uh, Apple may actually go down. So, what is so special about Steve Jobs? What is so special about Steve Jobs? Number one, he understood all right the planning and strategy behind creating a device that made people be addicted to it. So many Apple fans get addicted to the Apple's product that if you use Apple product, it becomes so user-friendly that when you switch over to Android, you face a big problem, isn't it? He also created an entire ecosystem. So a lot of time people actually buy Apple products is because of the ecosystem, isn't it? That he has actually created. So many would attribute that Job's success or Apple's success is because of Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs, sorry, Job. Uh, Steve Jobs basically, all right, has what we call business acumen. So now I'm going to introduce to you the concept of what business acumen is all about. Basically, it is the keenness and quickness in understanding and dealing with a business situation in a manner that is likely to lead to a good outcome. But simply, business acumen is really about you trying to make money for the company. All right, you are trying to make money for the company and not only do you make money for the company, you are able to sustain the success of the company. And that is very important. Eh? So a lot of us are able to make quick money for the company, but we are not able to success. Uh, sorry, we are not able to sustain the success of the company. All right. So therefore, strategists, CEOs, that's why they are paid so much money. Because they have that business acumen. And not all of us are able to do that, isn't it? Right? So therefore, individuals with business acumen, what kind of skills do they need to have? Typically, number one, they must have an acute perception of the entire business and they are able to see things from a bird's eye view. So therefore, successful strategies are not micromanagers. They don't micromanage. All right, they can make sense out of complexity and an uncertain future. Now, we know that the situation is becoming very uncertain, especially during the time of COVID, isn't it? Where many companies actually all right, lost money. And one of the companies that lost a lot of money was actually Singapore Airlines. Can you imagine a company that has been so successful for so many years was losing millions of dollars every day during the COVID period? So Asian Airlines, they actually lost more than $60 billion in 2020. $60 billion US dollars in 2020. Now, I would like to ask you the question now. Imagine if you are the CEO of SIA. Losing millions of dollars every day, what would you do? Anybody? You can own your mind and talk to us, all right? What would you do if you were the... All right, if you were the CEO of SIA when the company was losing millions of dollars every day, you know. Now, under normal circumstances, I can bet with you that a lot of CEOs will think of cost-cutting measures. Isn't it? All right, they will start to cut costs. Right? Now, what advantages does SIA have over its competitors in this region during the pandemic? Anybody? You know, SIA was losing a lot of money. Can somebody tell me what advantage or advantages does SIA have over its competitors in this region during the pandemic? Anybody would like to contribute? Uh, first of all, SIA, they are the quite uh, famous uh, in the, this region, right? They got a market share value this more than the uh, normal and uh, the rest of the other airlines, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So it... If they if they like to change one they are losing right There's some of the airline in the let's say for example in Brunei, the RBA they they trying to create the lunch flying uh, for the Brunei citizens right they they collect the amount of some money but they treat the lunch on board they land it back right they they sometimes they they they, they create some of the business uh, continuous continuity within their line. But SIA, I didn't see anything. They are moving that fast in, mm -hmm. in the area because of the amount of maybe amount of the, the, the staff, amount of uh, aeroplane they need to maintain is maybe more than the others. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any other contribution? Please identify yourself when you speak so that we know who you are, yeah? All right. Anybody else would like uh, to say anything? Yes, yeah, hi, here. here. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, I Yasham, think... please go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, so I think the another reason maybe SIA could uh, survive uh, uh, during this pandemic uh, probably because the same way as Apple is they are sitting on a quite huge uh, amount of cash uh, for, because of their past businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, SIA has the similar kind of uh, probably cash and liquidity available to them so that they can survive because any airlines if they are they don't hold or uh, they are not sitting on the hard cash. Uh, definitely they have to start doing the cost cutting and everything but sure. the same as apple uh, i think they they are also sitting on the same as the sitting on a very good cash uh, and they have the liquidity yeah the good thing is that over the years i think sia has a lot of reserves isn't it that they could actually use during the time of the pandemic when they were losing a lot of money whereas a lot of airlines like malaysia airlines thai airways went bankrupt even before the pandemic so during the pandemic time, they were very badly hit. Yes, Pali, your turn. Pali, you wanted to say something? Um, uh, personally, I think it's due to the government funding mm -hmm. that they receive. I think that's a very important part. I don't believe that they are sitting on a huge cash flow because it's been depleted by the duration of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But what's realistic is that you have a lot of job support packages and you also get uh, some financial support. In fact, it's not some, it's a huge amount of support from government and that really helped SIA yes. uh, so that they didn't have to retrench uh, most of their stuff and they will be ready to pick up the business as soon as we recover. From exactly that. and also Pearly you are absolutely right because the government actually pumped in a lot of money isn't it right now strangely during the pandemic time when everybody was cutting calls SIA was spending money SIA was still going around buying new planes SIA took that opportunity to refurbish most of their aircrafts. Remember, during that period of time, they bought over Silk Air and they merged Silk Air with SIA. So they refurbished a, a, a Silk Air uh, airplanes and, and built new business class, new first class in their planes. So they spent a lot of money during the pandemic time when everybody else was not. All right, then you can actually see that a lot of companies, when the company goes into the raid, when they are losing money, they will straight away execute cost-cutting measures. But SIA didn't, you know. Partly because of all the reasons that you were saying, you, you told us just now, uh, they were sitting on a lot of cash and also government pumped in a lot of money. So as a result of that, you see the SIA will be able to, all right, uh, survive the pandemic and probably will be the first airline to grow exponentially post-COVID. So being one of the best airlines and one of the most profitable airlines, all right, how would you prepare to grow the business in the future? How do you think that we should actually grow the business in the future? Should we actually buy more planes? Should we actually expand? Should we actually uh, 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 be more aggressive? And I think this should be the time for SIA to become more aggressive. And this is how they are going to make all the other competitors redundant, isn't it? Because now they know that all the other competitors are suffering as a result of the pandemic. SIA actually has an upper hand because the competition will change in the near future, whether we like it or not. So therefore, it takes somebody with that kind of business sense to be able to see into the future and dare to take that risk to spend more money now when all other companies are actually cutting costs because they actually see that the crisis created an opportunity for the airline to grow. So post-pandemic, when we go back to normalcy, and let's hope that this year we will, all right, SIA will be ready to grow, whereas the other airlines are still recovering from the losses. So this is actually part of business acumen where you know you are able to make sense out of complexity, and also uncertain future. We can expect that the future is going to become more and more uncertain, isn't it? Now, therefore, the people with business acumen and entrepreneurs, the successful businessmen, they are very decisive, they are very assertive. They are not people that will keep on changing their mind. And one of the skills that we all need to have as CEOs, as managers, as business leaders, all right, is to be assertive. Now, I was just having a conversation with my friend the other day. One of the reasons why I don't think I can ever become a CEO is that I am emotionally attached. I am emotionally attached to my students, to my friends, to my companies. All right. Now, as a CEO, as a leader, you must be emotionally detached. But that does not necessarily mean that you have to be a bad person. 
All right, but be emotionally detached. Then you can become more objective and be able to be assertive and make certain decisions that other people won't dare to make it. All right, are flexible if further changes is needed in the future. And more importantly, they are the people who are able to make strategic choices, thinking about all the implications. Now, I always tell this to my students in the class. Your decision is only as good as the criteria that you use in making those decisions. I always give this analogy, who you marry is not important. What criteria that you use in choosing who you want to marry, it becomes more important. So for example, all right, if you have to choose between investing in say China and Vietnam, which country will you invest in? Many people will tell me China because why the only criteria is the size of the market. China is big, it is growing. But do you know that a lot of companies, they went to China and they lost a lot of money. So therefore, the decision that you make must actually be based on a set of criteria. You have a lot of options. The choice that you make will depend on the criteria that you use in making those choices. Now, I would just like to use this, uh, 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 do an activity with all of you. All right, this one, I always use it in the class. Now, train track and children. Let's say a group of children were playing near two railway tracks. One still in use, while the other not in use. So only one child played on the disused track, the rest on the operational track, all right? The train came and you were just beside the track in the change. It was not possible to stop the train, but you could make the train change its course to the disused track and save most of the kids. However, that would also mean the lone child playing by the disused track would be sacrificed. Or would you rather let the train go its way? So let's look at it, the picture. So let's say now there are two tracks. One is in use, the other one is not in use. 10 children playing on the used track, one child playing on the disused track. The train comes, you are now standing at the track interchange. There is no way for you to stop the train, but what you can do is to actually change the cost of the train to allow the train to go into the disused track. But if you do so, you will kill one child. Or would you rather let the train go down the used track and if you do so, you take the risk of killing 10 children? So now what I want you to do is to make the decision, analyze the situation, think very carefully, decide your answer. Are you ready? So how many of you say that you will allow the train to go into the disused track? Anybody? All you need to do is just type yes into the chat box because somehow we are not able to use the poll uh, in this uh, Zoom. How many of you say that you will let the train go into the disused track? Francis, only one person. Ah. Okay, how many of you say that you will let the train go into the used track? Which means you let the train go into the used track and kill all the 10 children. Anybody? Okay, one person said so. Let the train go into the, uh, let the train go into the used track. Quite a number of you say that you will let the train go into the used track. Huh? I'm talking about use track, you know. All right. So quite a number and the rest. So we almost have half half that says that they will let the train go into the disused track. The other half say let the train go into the use track. Now I would like to hear from Lily. Lily, why do you say you let the train go into the disused track? Lily? I will do that maybe for the benefit of whoever get the best benefit, 10 children versus one. So, so I'll, I'll make use 10. Yeah. So if lives have to be lost, one is better than 10, isn't it? Francis, yes, that's you correct. also say disuse track. Why disuse track, Francis? For the same reason. I mean, it's really, really tragic for that one child, but at least it's one child. The other side has 10. So it's a very tough decision, but I don't think I have a choice. You don't have a choice, obviously, isn't it, right? So I think majority of you say go into the disused track. Some of you say go into the used track, isn't it? All right, good. Now, most people in this case, your class, all right, might choose to divert the cause of the train and sacrifice only one child. Why? Because it is a rational and an emotionally, morally correct decision. If lives have to be lost, one is definitely better than 10, isn't it? All right, one is actually better than 10. Now, 
Let's have another activity now. All right, let's look at another activity. Which option will you choose? All right, option A, 50% chance of winning $1,000 or 50% chance of winning nothing. So you either win $1,000 or you will win nothing at all. Or option B is a sure win. 100% chance of winning $500. Now, which one will you choose? All right, just type A or B. Will you choose A or will you choose B into the chat room? All right, let's see how many of you will say. All right, how many of you choose B, B, B? All right, early say A, B, 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 B. Only 2% choose A. The rest of you choose B. Eh? Early, why A? A is a 50% chance, you know. B is a sure win. Yes, but uh, there's this uh, opportunity to take a risk and be a winner, whereas an option B, uh, there wouldn't be room for you to double your winning. Okay, so Terence. So that probably if, you, if it was you, you will probably choose A, is it? Definitely A. Okay, City. So it's either you win or you, you lose. You win something or you win nothing, isn't it? There's yes. nothing in between. Huh? Okay, good. So City, why did you choose A, City? Um, I guess it's because there's a lower risk, but also there's a 50-50%. Basically, it's, it stays there, 50-50% uh -huh. chance of winning or nothing. But City, you say risk. Yeah. B has no risk at all, you know? B is a sure win one. You will definitely win $500. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's okay. Terrence, why A? I think my chance of high gain definitely will have high risk. Uh. Okay, good. So most of you in the chat room actually stated that you will choose option B. Isn't it? Most of you will actually choose option B. So it states that is all right. So therefore, you are using the utility theory, and that is normal. It states that essentially people are risk averse when it comes to making decisions. So that's the reason why a lot of you actually choose B. Because B has no risk. A, there is a risk of losing everything. But there is also a chance for you to gain everything. Isn't it? Right? So therefore, winning that $500 by choosing option B will give you the highest value because it carries no risk at all. So in this case, most of you actually chose B. Now that is actually a rational decision making, like what you did just now when I asked you about the train situation, most of you actually chose to let the train go into the disuse track. Why? Because when we make decision, it is logic that prescribes how decisions should be made. Isn't it? Why it is so? So why? So therefore, in this case, logic tells us that if we were to choose option B, there will be no risk. Logic tells us that if we were to let the train go into the disuse track, then we will be able to save more lives. So therefore, that is a logical decision. Now, I'd like to hear from those of you who actually say that you will allow the train to go into the use track. So I have Chris. Fonseca, Chris, why did you say you will let the train go into the use track, Chris? Chris? Can you own your mic to talk to us, Chris? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I think when doing business, sometimes the environment dictates the you know the the is being dictated by elements uh. so mm -hmm. we can never be sure that everything will go the way we plan like taking option b mm -hmm. you know because we example for the track you never know whether the 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 lever to bypass the train to another track is working or not so my thing is uh moving straight forward the probability is that uh some may get hit by the train and some may not but the the plan still had to somehow move forward like from a business context like, not so much on the humane side like, okay you know? good thank you so much chris thank you so much and I, i've got i hang it chun is it is that how you pronounce your name yep yep it chun why did you say use track it chun okay um firstly um is this is a disused track you will not know how well it is maintained i have passengers on train so the number of people on train might be even higher than, than the number of people on track. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, so this is why that I make that decision. And and the the disused track probably will lead me to somewhere that is even more dangerous. So so yeah, in, in that perspective. 
Very good, Ichen. And Stephen, would you like to contribute? Why do, would you allow the train to go into the disuse track? Stephen? Uh, hi, I'm Stephen, Stephen Leong. Uh, my opinion is uh, the disuse track, the uh, head of the disuse track is unknown. So we do not know whether there's any danger or uh, if the disused track will bring the train to another destination. But the so, other destination might actually be a better destination. Oh, well, <laughs> it could be worse. You know, oh. it, will, it will be uh, the life of nine children or the life of the entire train or even the inconvenience of all the passengers on the air. Exactly, exactly. Well done. So I would like to ask those of you who chose to let the train go into the disused track just now to look at the screen right now. Have you ever thought that the child choosing to play on the disused track in fact made the right decision to? Why should he die and be sacrificed because of his parents' stupid friends? Why should he? Isn't it? Right? And moreover, moreover, do you know that the track was not in use for some reason? To allow the train to go into this disused track, the whole train might derail and everybody might die, you know, on the train. So to make the proper decision is not try to change the course of the train because the kids playing on the operational track should have known very well that the track was still in use. And if they were to hear the silent sound, they will run. But can you imagine if you were to let the train to go into the disused track, that lone child would definitely die. Even if he were to hear the train sound, he might think that the track was on the other track. Sorry, the train was on the other track. He would definitely die. Right? Because he would never, never imagine that the train could actually go into the disused track. So therefore, logic tells you that you should let the train go into the disused track. Because whenever we make decisions, most of our decisions are prescribed by our way, our logical way of rationalizing things. One life is better than 10. Isn't it right? Therefore, in this case, we decide to take a lesser risk. Isn't it right? We decide to take a lesser risk. But can you imagine if the train was diverted, that lone child would definitely die. Isn't it? And moreover, like I told you, the track was not in use because of some reason. So if you were to allow the train to be diverted, what will happen is that more people will die. More people will actually die. Now, why am I using this as an example? Because I want you to know that at the end of the day, as a successful businessman, we dare to take certain risk. All right, just now when I ask you whether is it option A or option B, most of us logically will choose option B because we stand a chance to win. Uh, sorry, not stand a chance, we will guarantee win something. They said that very few of us will choose option A. Very few of us. Only the people who dare to take the risk will choose option A. Then, of course, it also depends on your situation in life. They said it also depends on your situation in life. For example, if you are a billionaire, come on, even if losing $1 million to you is nothing. So big companies, they are okay. They dare to make certain risky decisions. And if they win, they win big. But small companies may not be able to do so. The reason is because they don't have the resources to do so. Isn't it? Yet, I also come across some people who started off as very poor. They have absolutely nothing at all, but they dare to take chances. They dare to take the risk. And they become very successful. An example would be Jack Ma, Alibaba. Isn't it? He was a poor man. He was only an English teacher in a public school. He had nothing. He invited all his friends to his house and all he had was just a dream. He told his friends about his dream and his friends actually told him, don't waste your time. He said, you are so poor. What, what, what do you have to actually become successful? And you know what he said? And I love what he said. He said, yes, I am poor, but you know what? If I have nothing, I have nothing to lose. So he took that risk and today he's one of the richest. But many people won't dare to do that again. Many people are still happy being where they are right now. All right. And, uh, and, and what happened, uh, Jack Ma actually said this, many of us have a lot of dreams. We dream of what we want to do tomorrow, but tomorrow when we wake up, we still take the same path. 
we don't dare to take another path and become successful. And that's the problem with a lot of us. So if you look around here, uh, all right, you, all the successful businessmen, those billionaires and all that, most of them started off with just a dream. They have absolutely nothing. But of course, I'm not encouraging all of you tomorrow to start, you know, taking all kinds of risks, isn't it? All right. Uh, and of course, it is important for us. All right. It is important for all of us, all right, to take calculated risks as well. But I just want to show a point that a lot of us are only guided by our logic. But in reality, in business, a lot of things are illogical. And I'll tell you why later on. I'll tell you more later on. Uh, let's see what Salah Budin said. But the one child was responsible to play on the issue straight, but the other 10 child, okay. For someone to be, okay, good. Yeah. It is fair for majority to do the wrong thing. Yeah, probably yes. All right, Ken, thank you very much for your contribution. Okay, good. Let's move on. So therefore, when we talk about business acumen framework, remember this, acumen is housed in the mind. All right, it is actually housed in the mind. Whether you are prepared to take certain chances, take certain risks or not, it is actually in the mind. But of course, a lot of factors come into play. It also depends on our situation in life. All right, some people can afford to fail. Some people just cannot afford to fail, isn't it? The first thing that you need to have, all right, as a, some, a businessman, all right, and firstly, all right, you will need to have that financial literacy. And this is where the problem is. Uh, whenever we teach an MBA program, the most feared subject will always be financial. I don't even know why a lot of business people, they fear numbers, you know. Can you tell me this? Uh, business is all about numbers. If you don't like numbers, then you are in serious trouble. Nobody will make you a CEO if you cannot even read the financial statement of the company. So therefore, it is important for all of us to have that financial literacy. But some of us just don't, we don't like numbers, isn't it? The next one, all right, is that we need to have functional business. We need to be functional business savvy. All right, now that's where the problem is. Uh, all of us got promoted from a particular position. So when we become the CEO, the problem is that we are still very sales oriented. Because we were once a sales manager, promoted to become a sales director, then promoted to become VP of sales, then we become CEO. And when we become CEO, we are still very, very sales oriented. And that's where the problem is. So as people move up in a particular function, they have this struggle. They cannot break away from their own position, the original position. All right. And as a result of that, they become very, very myopic. So a company with a CEO that is very sales oriented, you realize the operation will suffer. A CEO who is very operational oriented, you realize the sales will suffer. So as a CEO, what you need to do is to have what we call the general manager thinking. See, why there is a reason why you are called a GM, general manager. Therefore, you must become a generalist. You, be, you cannot become a specialist. I've never come across a title called a specialized general manager. There is no such thing. So as a GM, you must actually have a full view of the organization, knowing a little bit about everything. And that is the benefit of MBA. Because in an MBA, we teach you a little bit of everything. You will learn about HR, learn about marketing, learn about finance, learn about strategy. You need to learn a little bit about everything in order for you to have a bird's eye view of the entire organization. And that is very important. All right. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of us cannot break away from our from our, the, from our functional role. So if you are a HR person and then you get promoted to become a CEO, you know, you still focus a lot on HR. And as a result of that, the company will actually fail. Then the next thing is that you are able, therefore, to create what we call, all right, certain value, what we call enterprise value, so that the company will be able to grow. The company will become richer because you are able to create certain value. And I'll show you shortly. All right, what this means, uh, how certain successful entrepreneurs have created certain values. So therefore, there are four things that you need to have. Number one, financial literacy. Number two, functional business savvy, and you are able to have a helicopter view. All right, GM thinking, and also enterprise value mindset. And in order to do so, to create greater value for the organization, you must be prepared to take certain risk. Now, what I want you to do is this now. Eh? All right, what I want you to do is this. I'm going to shortly ask you to take your handphone and scan a QR code. 
And then you are supposed to rank of the four skills that you need to have. Which one do you think is the strongest skill that you have? Which one is your strength? Which one is your weakness? So later on, you will scan the QR code on your handphone and the first one will be your strongest uh, 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 skill that you have and the last one will be the weaker skill. And let's see how many of you would rank certain skill as most important or as your strongest uh, skill and which one is your weakest skill, all right? So let's take out your handphone now. All right, let's take out your handphone and you just scan this QR code and then key in 76810665. All right, then you will be able to do the ranking. All right, the first ranking, the first one, remember, is your strength, is the strongest skill that you have. For example, if you're strong in numbers, then you will choose financial literacy. Then you move on to the second one. All right, okay? Good. I'll give you one minute. Okay, can all of you do that? All right, come, let's look at the score, shall we? All right, let's look at the score. Okay, very good. Most of you actually choose functional business savvy that you feel that that is your strength, which means you are a GM, you are a general manager. I'm quite surprised that most of you chose financial literacy as your second strength. Because normally when I do this activity with my students, most of them will actually choose financial literacy as their weakest. A skill, you know, all right, as their greatest weakness. So this batch is not too bad. Eh? Most of you actually chose GM thinking, financial business heavy, which means you are ready to become a CEO. You are ready to take on a GM position and you are therefore ready, all right, to bring your company forward. Now, it is very important for all of us to have this kind of skill. Eh? All right, it is absolutely important. This one is the most important, I feel. All right, GM thinking is also very important. All right, uh, very good. And um, okay, all right, come, let's move on now, shall we? Let's move on. Thank you very much for your participation. And we shall move on to the next slide. Okay, good. So now what we want to look at will be the, sorry. Okay, what we want to look at is the importance of business acumen. Why do you think business acumen is so important? So far, I've been talking nonstop. Anybody has anything to contribute? Any question to ask? Anyone? No? All right, good. The importance of business acumen. Number one, it gives a clearer focus on things that are strategically important. Now, I like the word strategically important here. Why is this important? Far too many just... Too many managers out there are only interested in all the small things that don't even matter at all. These are what we call the micro-managers. Do you regard yourself as micro-managers that only want to look at all the nitty-gritty, the micro-details? And then you get everybody so upset, isn't it? Now, what are strategically important decisions? These are the decisions, once you make them, they cannot be reversed. For example, if you were to set the wrong price, can you change the price? The answer is yes. All right, if you come up with the wrong advertisement that the advertisement cannot even work at all, can you change the advertisement? The answer is yes. But can you imagine if you were to buy over a wrong company? Can you imagine if you were to go into a wrong market? Now, that kind of decision cannot be reversed. And now you know why CEO need to have that business acumen? Because the CEO is paid so much money to make strategically important decisions. Now, the CEO should not be interested in knowing what time you come up, come to work. The CEO should not be interested in knowing how many people took MC today. The CEO is not interested in all these things. Isn't it? The CEO should actually be more interested in which company should be buying. 
All right, the CEO should be more interested in knowing how to grow the business. And that's the reason why the CEO of SIA, while every other airline was thinking of how to cut costs, he was thinking about how to grow the business. Is that even though when SIA was losing millions of dollars, but he knows that once the pandemic is over, SIA will be the first airline to grow, whereas all the other airlines will continue to suffer and try to recover from the pandemic. Now, how many CEOs were there to make this kind of decision? How many CEOs were there to make this kind of proposal to the board of directors? Let's continue spending money. How many of us were there to do that? How many of us will be convincing enough to convince all our shareholders that this is the time for us to grow the business? And therefore, people with business acumen, they must always focus on things that are strategically important. Now you go back and think about your own manager in the office. Are they like that? Most of the managers out there, they are more interested in knowing, you know, this month, how many people took leave. They are more interested in knowing what time did you come to work today? And if you are late, they want to think of ways to punish you. Now, if you are a functional line manager, yes, I can understand all these will be important. The unfortunate thing is like I told you just now, as you move up the hierarchy, you cannot let go of your functional role. You don't realize that now you are a CEO, you are no longer a line manager. And that's the problem. You need to respond to the changes in environment. Isn't it? All right. And that is the problem. A lot of the managers, they are just too slow in changing. I remember many years I was ago, many years ago, I was working for a Japanese company. You know, the Japanese companies are very uh, forward-looking. All right, they are very innovative, very forward-looking. They are the ones that actually create the environment. I remember my Japanese boss actually told me this, you know, whether you like it or not, the environment will change. And the pace at which the environment is changing is faster and faster and faster. The problem is not the environment. Whether you like it or not, the environment will change. The problem is you are too slow in responding to the environment. That's where the problem is. All right, therefore, we are able to create a totally new market that will make competition totally obsolete. We dare to take that risk when people do not believe in it. We be the first to do it. So you look at it. All these products, you thought it was not possible. But what happened? So now we are talking about air taxi, you know. We are talking about vacuum train. We call it the hyperloop. 20 years ago, people said you must be crazy, driverless bus, but now we have that in NTU. Isn't it? So therefore, do you dare to imagine the future possibilities? There is this guy who was who is called a crazy man called Elon Musk. But Elon Musk is now the richest man. You know why? Because he dared to think about the future possibilities when man, many people say that it is not possible. So you just imagine what VR technologies can do in the future. Elon Musk is now telling us that in about 10 to 15 years time, there will be demand for space travel. How many people will be crazy enough to think about that? Many managers are not. Uh, they are only interested in now. This one, what will be my sales figure? You know why? Because all of us as managers are often judged by short-term results. We are never judged by long-term intention. And that's the problem. But you look at all the successful companies, they are actually looking at long term and not about today, not about tomorrow, not about this month, not about this year. So how many of us actually dare to take that risk? When you go into the future and that's when it becomes more risky. So all these products that you see on the screen right now, just about five years ago, and when you tell people about this, they tell you, are you crazy or what? Xiao la. Now, how is it possible for us to have flying air taxi? Now, it is possible now. Right? Through the drone technology, it is possible. Isn't it? Just about 10 years ago, we could never imagine that we could actually conduct online teaching. But today, it is possible. So, therefore, we want to talk very quickly about what innovation is all about. All right? Innovation is actually different from creation. Correct? Now? You want your staff to be innovative. You don't want your staff to be creative. You know what's the difference? Anybody would like to try to tell me what is the difference between creativity and innovativeness? Anybody? Let me just ask a question, yeah? All right, otherwise, Ayakanu, is it? Ayakanu? Is that how we pronounce your name? Ayakanu, can you on your mind to speak to us? 
Yeah, it's the, the second part is actually my name. You can address me Mutu. Mutu, all right, thank you. Mutu, can you tell us what in your opinion is the difference between creativity and innovation? Innovation, um, the, the, the explanation, what you put it in the slide is the, the correct one, but uh, I couldn't think anything out of this now. Okay, good. All right, Ken, let's ask, anybody would like to volunteer, Joanne? Would you like to try, Joanne? What, in your opinion, is the difference between creativity and innovation? Would you want your staff to be creative or you want your staff to be innovative? Joanne, are you there, Joanne? Okay, Namal, would you like to try, Namal? So, uh, like, like, say, like, innovation, right? If, if I like my uh, staff to be innovation, mean they, they were continuous doing something, well, uh, along the my strategy right but if my my stuff is a creative they can be they can i we may have a different uh, different view of ideas it mm. might be more successful to the company yeah uh, not really but you are almost right how do i pronounce your name sorry you are no 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 now, is it now? Uh, yeah. creativity is just about an idea so you're right the idea may or may not work eh? Right. Yes. Creativity may or may not work, but innovation does not need to be something new. Innovation can be something old, but you actually make it work better. So your Apple iPhone is an innovative product. It is not a creative product. Because long before we have Apple phone, we already had one generation of PDA phone, but it was Steve Jobs that actually make it work better. So therefore, it is about innovation now. It is not about creativity. Let's look at the screen now. What is so big deal about, sorry, what is so big deal about this technology, you tell me? Can somebody tell me what is so big deal about a smart TV? It is just about a TV where you can actually make it, uh, uh, you can actually uh, use the TV to serve internet and that's about it. Anybody could have thought about it, but you know what? Nobody thought about it. Nobody thought about it. It was Samsung that gave us the first smart TV. That today all TVs become smart TV. But what is so big deal about a smart TV? You tell me what is so big deal about a smart TV, isn't it? So therefore, there is a difference between uh, creativity and innovation. You consider all these examples. What is so big deal about Uber? It's a very simple concept. Grab. It is the world's largest taxi company now, but they own no vehicle. Long before we had Facebook, we already had Friendster. Is that it? Long before we had Facebook, we already have Friendster, right? But what is so big deal about Facebook? It is now the world's most popular media owner, but they create absolutely no content at all. What is so big deal about Alibaba? Alibaba is just a fusion of Amazon.com and eBay put together. Isn't it? But today, Alibaba is the world's most valuable retailer, but it owns absolutely no inventory at all. What is so big deal about Airbnb? I mean, anybody could have thought about it, isn't it? Airbnb. But now look at Airbnb. It is the world's largest accommodation provider, but it owns no property at all. And now if you were to look at it, come to think about it on high side, Uber, YouTube, Airbnb, all these, uh, it's a very simple concept. WhatsApp. Before WhatsApp, we had Viber, right? you remember? Right now, what's so big deal about WhatsApp? But today, WhatsApp is so strong, so much so that we use the word WhatsApp in our daily conversation. Have you WhatsApp him? Have you WhatsApp him? Isn't it? So therefore, you think about it. All these are what we call innovation. They are not totally new, you know. But the people are able to think in a very innovative way and make it a big success. Now, that's what business acumen is all about. It is not about sales, 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 sales. Therefore, in this case, a lot and a lot of all these people with business acumen, they are what we call the entrepreneurs. All right, they are the ones who have that vision. All right, so therefore, this is very important. They have to have that vision. And more importantly, they must be able to convince people that their vision is right. So there is this crazy guy called Elon Musk. He says this, anyone can move to Mars and gas cars will be like steam engines. He made all these statements and people are laughing at him, you know. 
How is it possible for us to actually go to Mars? How is it possible for us to actually have space travel? And it is possible now. A lot of companies are now looking at the potential of actually building a hotel on the moon because they actually believe that in about 15, 20 years time, there will really be demand for space travel. So what happened? Elon Musk actually came up with this thing called a hyperloop. He said, you know the hyperloop? So can you imagine if we were to build a hyperloop linking Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, we will be able to reach Kuala Lumpur in within 15 minutes. Isn't it? Now let's look at a short video. Now if it's too loud for you, all right, if you think that it is too loud for you, uh, you can actually, uh, what we call it, uh, you know, lower down the volume on your computer. Let's look at a very short video, all right? In the beginning, it was about instinct, moving from place to place, initially for survival, then to pioneer. Today, we travel because we can. On vacation, to business meetings, from point A to point B isn't just a car ride. It's a train, it's a plane, and soon, even a space flight away. But what about efficiency? There's a gap between imagination and actualization. You can go anywhere on Earth, anywhere. But you can actually go to like the top of Mount Everest. There's no place you can't go, anywhere. So I think we've explored the boundaries, at least the physical boundaries of Earth, quite thoroughly. You're describing how we can go anywhere on Earth now, but the methods with which we use to get there, do you think they're efficient? The most important thing that needs to happen is the transition of transportation to electric. The ideal long-distance transportation uh, mechanism is a supersonic vertical takeoff and landing electric jet. And then there's a special case of cities which have a lot of travel between them, below about 500 miles of distance, where um, I think the Hyperloop would be useful. It is a special case solution, because once the distances get, get long, then the amount of time that an aircraft takes to ascend and land, which is most of what it does in a 500 mile trip, that percentage declines, and then it's better to just use aircraft. I know that there are various companies that are trying to create uh, the Hyperloop, and uh, honestly, I think it's a lot easier than, than people think. The blueprints are pretty complicated. Well, blueprints are always kind of complicated, and I mean, yes, there's math, <laughs> but it's really not that hard. It still sounds pretty complicated, Elon. It's like a tube with an air hockey table. It's just a low-pressure tube with a pod in it that uh, runs on, on air bearings, on air skis, with uh, an air compressor on the front that's taking the, the high-pressure air buildup on the nose and pumping it through the air skis. It's really, I swear, it's not that hard. <laughs>
so right now there is only one guy or maybe two of them all right uh, that is elon musk and the other one is richard branson they are crazy enough to imagine how the future will look like and i believe that it will happen and you just imagine ladies and gentlemen if that were to happen what will happen to all the airlines what will happen to all the budget airlines what i'm trying to tell you is this eh? that people with business acumen they are not interested in fighting the competitors. They are interested in making their competitors totally obsolete. All right, so therefore, let's conclude. There is this guy called Tony Fernandez. You know his story, isn't it? A uh, well-respected guy in Malaysia. He was a pilot. And what happened? He used up all his money in the bank to start a company. He actually bought over this defunct company called AirAsia.com for one dollar, he paid one dollar to buy over that company, and then he started building that company. And you know what happened was he spent all his money in the bank account. All he had was just a plan. He went to knock on the doors of many banks. Nobody believed him. Everybody said he was a crazy guy. How could you possibly charge somebody to fly from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore twenty-five dollars, and then you think that you will be able to make money? Everybody thought that he was a crazy guy, but all he had was just a dream. All right, and what happened was that one bank actually believed in his plan, and today he's one of the richest guys in Asia. All right, so strategy exists in the mind of the leader, uh, and therefore, in this case, these are the people who dare to create that vision, and they are able to visualize how the market will be in the future. All right, it is rooted in the experience and the intuition, the gut feeling of the leader. It is therefore not a rational decision-making process. They dare to take calculated risk. All right, they are not those that actually want to choose option B because that is the safer route. They are the ones who dare to choose option A. It's either I win it all or I lose all. But how many of us dare to do that? Honestly, how many of us dare to do that? I won't. I will probably choose option B also. All right, the leader that promotes the vision single-mindedly, and therefore this leader will always, always be attached to the company. Just like how Steve Jobs, when we talk about Apple, is Steve Jobs. We talk about Singapore, is Lee Kuan Yew. We talk about Virgin, is Richard Branson, isn't it? All right, so therefore characteristics of an entrepreneur take risk. They are the ones who come up with new innovations, inspirational innovator. They are very optimistic. All right, these are the people who have very strong business acumen. So in conclusion, I would like to say this, all right, we need to take risks, isn't it, right? While we are all aware that life is full of tough decisions that need to be made, but quick decision may not always be the right one. Remember, what is right is not always popular and what is popular is not always right. So therefore, what is right is not always popular. Just like Elon Musk coming out with all these visions, people are saying that you must be nuts. People are saying that you must be nuts, isn't it, to think about all these things. But hey, they could be right. And I think most likely they will be right, isn't it? But those that decide to play it safe because that is the more popular decision may not always be right. So the popular decision is to allow the train to go into the disuse track. But that may not always be the right decision. I would like to leave you with this. Everybody makes mistakes. And that's why we put erasers on pencils. Entrepreneurship, business acumen is a process of learning. And we learn the fastest by making mistakes. All right. So I've come to the end of my presentation. Are there any, is there anyone that would like to share with us more about your experience? Or are there any questions that you would like me to answer? I can't promise you that I'll be able to answer all the questions. All right, uh, but um, I will try. Anybody? Anybody with regards to what I've covered, with regards to your future MBA course or whatever, you want to ask me question you mean? Anybody? If not, all right, thank you very much for joining us. All right, this evening, I hope that uh, you have learned something and uh, I hope uh, that, you know, moving forward, you will be able to apply some of the skills that I shared with you. All right, and uh, of course, I hope that, you know, I will be able to see some of you uh, in my MBA class in the near future. Okay, so thank you very much. Can I check if you could check?
sorry, it, it goes too fast. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you so much for the very kind words that you have said. Uh, I hope all of you are able to, uh, you know, learn something out of it. Remember, although we say that it is important for us to take certain risks, but you know, somehow we need to make, we have to take some uh, calculated risks. Yeah? I'm not asking you to go back to your office tomorrow and start to change everything. Okay, Ken. All right. If no question, thank you very much. I'll hope to see you again. All right. If not, all the best to you and God bless you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for thank coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Frankie. Thank, Thank you very much indeed.